Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the regular meeting of our budget committee for today, October 10th, 2018. I'm the chair of this committee. My name is Lene Palmasano and with me here at the dais are council members Cano and Jenkins. I do anticipate quite a few others joining us uh, as we progress. It's just been a slow morning to get in, I think. Um, we have a we have a pretty tight agenda today and our first uh, presentation is from the health department with our commissioner Gretchen Musicant. Uh, so I'll just let you get started. Okay. You're already all set with the yep. presentation and everything. Yep. Terrific. Thank Welcome. You. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, just want to start uh, very briefly by um, telling you the goals of our department because it's also the way we've organized our work and our and our divisions. So. Um, a healthy start to life and learning. We really focus on very young children and young families, forming families. Secondly, thriving youth and young adults, um, focusing on um, the well-being of, of adolescents and young adults because we know that if people start out life well in that very early time and then again have reinforcement in adolescence, they will have a better trajectory in life. Uh, third area is healthy weight and smoke-free living. It looks at preventing chronic diseases. Uh, fourth is a healthy place to live, knowing we spend a lot of time in our homes, looking at issues like lead and asthma. Safe places to eat, swim, and stay. That's making sure that our vibrant restaurant and entertainment community is a, is a healthy one for people to access. A healthy environment, um, thinking about uh, regulation, but also preventative measures that help us move in the right direction to have a healthy environment. And then all that rests on a strong urban public health infrastructure that allows us to do that work. This is our org chart. It's not exactly up to date. Um, we will, in 2019, uh, be moving the research director over to a manager position following a retirement. And then um, my, my Deputy Commissioner of Health, which has been um, filled for a few months now, um, will take on uh, responsibilities of administration assurance and the research area. So I'm gonna move on to the change items that are being recommended by the mayor. So I read the paper this morning. I don't know if you had time to do that, but um, our police chief in there talked about um, uh, violence in the community and the need to call it a public health issue. And I was um, so heartened to hear him quoted as saying that. I know he's been a, a supporter of our collaborative work and we have been thinking about violence prevention as a public health issue for more than a decade. Two of the programs that are follow within that um, umbrella are being recommended for funding by the mayor. The first is Next Step, and that is a program, a hospital-based program, uh, which has really proved to be a powerful way to stop the revolving door of violent injuries in our hospitals and in our communities. The mayor is recommending one-time funding of 130000 that um, keeps the program intact. There was also one-time funding in 2018 of a similar amount. Um, this is a collaboration with uh, North Memorial and HCMC. Um, they have um, kind of put some of their own skin in the game, so they have some in-kind administrative support. We've also been able to get some state grant funding. And we think that having the city as um, a funding partner helps to pull all those resources together um, and do the good work that is occurring through that program. The second uh, youth violence prevention area that the mayor is recommending um, new funding for is our group violence intervention program. And this is a gun violence um, prevention and intervention model that focuses on group involved individuals or we might think of them as gangs it brings uh, the community, law enforcement, and social services together to address the issue of gang and gun violence and has shown to be um, quite effective. Um, you can find some of those results um, in the longer budget um, proposal that we uh, sent to the 
to the mayor as well as um, looking at some of the results um, in our results Minneapolis uh, for the department. So the mayor's recommendation is uh, 370,000 in 2019. Um, 300 of that is 300,000 of that is ongoing and 70,000 is one time. This will allow us to maintain our current efforts as, as a federal grant um, ends and to do some expansion into south side so um, to date it has focused primarily on african-american community in north minneapolis and we know that there is um, violence and group violence in the southern part of the city as well and so this will allow us to move into that um, realm on that note we have a question or comment from councilmember cano thank you madam chair so, Commissioner uh, Musicant, so going back to the Next Step program, mm -hmm. <clears throat> how much was um, in the budget last year for this program? Just the same, 130? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member So the only change is that it, is it moving from one time to ongoing? Um, it is still one time here, and the narrative may say ongoing. I tried to there's a gremlin that kept putting the one-time <laughs> funding slide in here i mean the ongoing slide but the mayor's recommendation is one time okay so there's no change from last year to this year except that last year's no not in the program per se madam chair councilmember cano but because it was one-time funding last time that essentially zeroes out this year and so it gets placed in again um but from a implementation perspective it's the same level as last year okay and the 130 covers one ft within the city or what is what does the 130 cover madam chair councilman Ocano, it um, matches with this grant that we have been able to help the hospitals get from the state um, and so it creates a program that now can be functional in both hospitals um, north memorial has chosen to uh, start their program through HCMC and so it's really one program that serves both hospitals um, and allows them to have staff um, employed or stationed in both hospitals okay um, and then on the GVI project so we're moving um, the allocation from the three so it'll be three hundred thousand that is ongoing and you've mentioned was it seventy or eighty that's one time um, the allocation in uh, madam chair councilmember Cano the allocation in 2019 is three hundred and seventy thousand mm -hmm. and the ongoing portion of that is three hundred thousand so that leaves seventy of it as one time seventy is one time okay yeah, we've been having a lot of discussions about this program, and um, uh, I know that Councilmember Philippe Cunningham is um, very hands-on uh, on this topic, so I'll reserve a lot of my questions to other meetings that we have in City Hall about this, but I just want to let my colleagues know that I, I don't believe the 370 is going to allow us to do um, the continued support and demand that the... Uh, north side of the city deserves and requires around this issue in addition to servicing communities on the south side and we've had a lot of discussions with staff about this in the past um, so I just want to kind of put this on people's radar that as we're seeing the headlines of more violence happening in the city and as we received a presentation at our public safety committee meeting the last cycle I believe on um, the gun violence that's happening in Minneapolis uh, this is an area that needs a lot more attention and that needs a lot more resources um, so I just want to flag that for folks is that um, the 370 won't be enough for both North and South Minneapolis G GVI work thank you thank you um, I did want to just clarify um, Councilmember Bender and I were just curious because we have actively sought to put more money into the Next Step program in the past, albeit one-time money. And our understanding last year 
was that it would have some level of rollout at North Memorial, even if not full. But based on the your slide, does that mean that it it's the previous slide? But um, does that mean that it has not yet gone into North Memorial? Uh, Madam Chair, no, it is in North Memorial this year. Okay, uh, Council Member Bender, and then Cunningham. Thanks, Madam Chair. That was that was my question too. I know for many years, Councilmember Palmasano and I and others worked to to help bring those resources to expand to North Memorial. I think it's I just I would underscore what Councilmember Cano said. Um, I've long been a champion for adding more resources to violence prevention, both through Next Step and GVI. And I think, I mean, I would welcome proposals from any of us to, to continue investing in this work. And I just want to thank you for the leadership of the health department. I know there's a lot of balance to be had with working together with the police department, which has been, the chief is extraordinarily supportive of, of violence prevention work and our community partners. And it's some of the, I think, most um, upstream deep work that we're doing as a city and the health department's approach to building those community relationships is why it's been so successful. So I just wanted to offer my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I apologize for being a little bit late, but um, I just wanted to um, really raise and praise the work of the health department in the violence prevention area. Uh, it's really expanded beyond youth violence prevention as we've seen, and that's a good thing. It's really growing, expanding. We're seeing content expertise uh, really starting to flourish in the violence prevention area. Um, I don't know if this was mentioned prior to me getting here, but we are currently working on developing an office of violence prevention within the health department. Um, and so that will be going before council in the next month or so. Um, and so I've been working um, very closely with the health department and uh, with stakeholders and really I'm diving into the budget to be able to figure out where there are spaces for us to make increased investments. So um, this is a conversation I'm very happy to take offline with folks and talk more about how we can robustly support ongoing uh, the violence prevention work and institutionalize it in a way that we see other work institutionalized in the city. We don't want to keep doing one-time dollars when we know that the work is working. Um, we find ongoing dollars for enforcement strategies. Um, I think we should be also looking at ongoing funding and investment in intervention and prevention as well. So thank you everybody for your support. I'm really excited to hear that so many of my colleagues are interested in this area because truly this is what's what's working. We are figuring it out here. We're seeing while we have spikes of violence, the overall, the work that is being done in these two programs in particular are seriously interrupting cycles. So I just wanted to take an extra moment to be able to say thank you for your leadership and to Sasha and Josh and also open up an invitation for colleagues to come and collaborate with me on this because it's something that I've been uh, very passionate about since, since we started the term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your comments of support and interest. Um, so the next item is um, asthma intervention. Uh, the CDC has um, identified this intervention as, as um, something that they believe um, delivers a, a terrific return on investment and is very effective. It is something that we have done episodically when we could find a little bit of money in a grant or something like that. Um, the mayor's recommendation is to fund one half FTE and $71,000. Um, what this will allow us to do is really expand this model of going into homes and inspecting them, educating about allergen triggers, and then offering supplies, um, which are allergen bedding and HEPA air filters and so on. We have found in our own work that we have been able to cut significantly school absenteeism, work absenteeism for parents of children, and, and um, emergency room visits. So um, we also know that uh, there are opportunities from a policy perspective to get reimbursement for some of this, and so we will continue to work at the state level to do that um, as we build on this program that is recommended by the mayor. The next uh, mayor's recommendation is uh, one-time funding of $50,000 to support implementation of the recommendations of the multi-jurisdictional 
um, task force that was created this year. Um, we uh, worked with the mayor's office and talked about some of the sort of essential building blocks of creating a, um, a successful collaborative effort. And one is to have a backbone, someone who can convene meetings, follow up, help guide implementation, measure outcomes, maybe even seek um, grant funding. And so we expect um, to uh, use this funding for um, a consultant of some sort who would help do that. We have also um, connected with AmeriCorps and um, they have identified a position for us to have which would complement this person's, this um, $50,000 um, consultant. We are seeking applicants for that AmeriCorps position. But um, so we hope that we will have some more rigorous support for the work that's going on related to opioids as a result of this recommendation. Thank you. Question or comment? Go ahead, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to, so our, so does that mean that the uh, mayor's task force on um, opioids, is that going to be, be then officially moved into the health department or is it, so where officially will the work live, I guess is, is my question. Madam Chair, Council Member Cunningham, I haven't been asked that question. Um, so um, I'm not sure. The, the recommendation is for the um, contract relationship with this consultant and the guidance of daily work to come out of the health department. All right, thank you for that clarification. The final mayor's recommendation is something that uh, Council Member Cunningham um, spoke about briefly and that is the creation of an Office of Violence Prevention. This is something that um, would be consistent with the uh, action that you as a council have taken in changing the um, Youth Violence Prevention Executive Committee to an overall violence prevention um, committee so that we can think about things that are going across, going on across the enterprise from a prevention perspective and try and pull them together and align them. This 25,000 is really just a planning um, fund so that we can think about uh, we can learn about what's being done elsewhere, Milwaukee, other communities that have such offices and begin to um, structure such an office um, for ourselves um, in the health department for Minneapolis. Commissioner, we have a question or a comment from Council Member Fletcher. I think it might have been about the last, about the opioids piece sure. though. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, <clears throat> I had a chance to meet the opioid coordinator who was just hired at the county. And so I guess I just wanted hmm. to find out sort of how are you thinking about this uh, position working with the person at the county and is there is there a chance that this is an area where the county is stepping up and we don't need to be duplicative uh, if they've hired a coordinator to sort of think about multi-jurisdictional work around uh, this or is there a value in having someone coordinating uh, sort of in an interdisciplinary way within the city in addition to the position that the county's already created? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Fletcher. Um, I think we're still waiting for some of the recommendations from our own multi-jurisdictional team to come forward, but we in the health department have had a meeting with the county coordinator as well. Um, I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done, and so what's important to do is to find out who's doing which parts, and then to find out you know, how do we proceed with the parts that aren't being done. Um, so I think that that's what this coordinator would help us do is to figure out that match so we're not uh, tripping over each other but complementing each other's work. So that um, I'm sorry, um, Council Member okay. Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I wanted to ask um, about the resources that your department has been able to provide for the emergency response to the encampment mm -hmm. and also understand how that looks going forward and particularly with an eye to the fact that I know we have staff time being devoted across departments but I know that at least in the past the health department has been primarily funded through grants which probably come with obligations about staff time too so to the extent that you could now explain a bit of that context for us both what's happened so far this year and what we might expect going forward and then how it might be unique in the health department given this staff time dynamic with grant funding? Yes, thank you for that question, Council Member um, Bender, Chair Palmasano. 
Um, we have been uh, tracking our time. And so um, I believe that in the first month, it was in excess of $8,000 of time. And we expect that we're, that's probably an under report. Um, I have a team of about 12 to 15 people. We meet two or three times a week in addition to having separate meetings to, to be out in the field, figure out what's going on, coordinate the medical um, care. It's a fairly complex environment for communication, and so it does take a fair amount of time um, for these individuals to do that coordination. We have also um, financed the, the, the toilets and the hand washing equipment, and, and that's been another 4,000 or so um, per month. So um, your, your question is an excellent one about where, you know, what kind of fluidity do we have in our, in our funding? Um, I guess we're taking it as it comes, but it is a challenge because of those people that have been identified um, to do this work. Some of them are funded by general fund, but some of them are also grant funded. And so um, that will continue to be a financial um, challenge for us. Do you think there is a need for us to allocate funding specific in the budget for 2019? And again, that could be a question for now or um, between now and, and the end of the cycle. So Chair Palmasano, Council Member Bender, did you say 18? For 19. 19. Um, I think that will depend on what our plan is. Um, in the Navigation Center and what responsibilities um, the city maintains. And maybe, Madam Chair, just a comment. I, um, I think there's strong support in the council, including from myself, in investing dollars and staff time in the response to the encampment. I just want to be cognizant of, particularly as we take action to add family leave and, and you know, and try to become a better employer that we understand that adding more um, responsibility to staff without adding more resources is really counter to that value um, and particularly if we're looking at you know months or years worth of additional responsibility with no additional resources and so I asked the question to make sure that when we're asking our staff to do more particularly department heads and division directors and those folks who are already likely working more than full-time in a normal work week, um, now with the added responsibility of an emergency response, I just want to make sure that we are um, understanding what support we need to give our staff to be able to to complete their normal duties on it. In addition to this, or or if it's just re, re, you know reducing our expectations for the other day to day work during a time where we're asking for more of an emergency response, I think that's another option. But it feels very uncomfortable to me to continue to ask staff to do more. With, without more resources or less um, of the other responsibility. So thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, I will share that with staff because um, it, uh, it is above and beyond and we have not been able to say no to other things. Sure. Um, Council Member Gordon. Thank you. I didn't want to ask about any of the change items, but I just wanted to ask a more general question, I guess, in, um, Past discussions, we've talked about the number of uh, health inspectors, particularly for um, um, food and restaurants. And I know that we went through a fee study. We um, approved increasing the fees so that there'd be more revenue coming in. And I was expecting to maybe see some increase in health inspectors so we could keep pace with all the restaurants out there. Um, I notice it's not in the mayor's recommended budget. It's just something that the that um, you brought forward and recommended to be in the in the mayor's budget. Do we think we have enough um, health inspectors to to meet the needs and our obligations to the state to be the their um, health inspector of our restaurants and our hotels and pools? Because um, I don't. I I just thought with the increase mm -hmm. in revenue, one of the reasons we wanted to do the fee study was to make sure that we were capturing enough to cover our costs so that we could do a better job keeping up. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Gordon, uh, last year the council did um, identify uh, funding for two positions, one-time funding, and so with this um, budget, those positions will we will not be able to keep those positions. Um, so in in essence, there will be a, a cut of two positions in 19. 
Uh, we have invested a fair amount in those staff. It takes about six months um, to get staff up to speed because of all of the standards that are expected by the state uh, health department and Department of Agriculture. So it's um, it, it's not, they are not the kind of positions where you can just like add and subtract and and not have repercussions. It it takes quite a while to get them up to speed. But like I said. Um, the recommendation for the mayor um, does not continue the funding that occurred uh, one time basis last year. So it will be a cut in staff for us. So just to refresh my own memory and maybe everybody else's, um, I think I had something to do with that one time expenditure. And I think that while I was making that one time expenditure, I was very clear that the intention was to look at the fee structure to see if maybe we weren't recovering our costs enough so that we could go through a process of legitimately increasing the fees, thus increasing the general fund kind of in that general area to prove to ourselves that we could we could make these ongoing positions. Because I certainly um, don't think it's a great practice, and I probably had advice at the time, to do one-time funding for staff. Um, so um, this is a correction I think maybe we could make during the budget process, hopefully, here and something that I intend to work on. What would you say the... Um, amount of money we would need to make sure that we don't actually have a reduction in staff of these two positions. Are we talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars? Is that Madam Chair, Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, that would be about what we are talking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to, oops, gosh, this book is quite tall. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share some of my thinking around this and, um, and uh, Council President Bender's comments about what is the, the role of, um, you know, the health department, uh, the health department's funding and the encampment and just how we're seeing, you know, the last maybe six to nine, nine months of, of work around issues of gun violence prevention, um, you know, supporting grassroots efforts to bring solutions forward around community safety or community safety beyond policing, some of the work we're doing around um, commercial sexual exploitation and really supporting the women um, and connecting them to resources and opportunities, as well as how we look at employment programs and how employment pro programs connect to the, the conversation of uh, reducing and preventing violence in our neighborhoods. Um, I do want to share that, I, you know, I'm very excited to support the work that, that Councilmember Cunningham is leading on this front with the uh, creation of the Office of, of Violence Prevention. And I think that that's opening up a conversation that is much needed in within our system about how do we better organize and focus our resources so that we're, no, we're not so diffuse with the work that we're doing and how do we uh, better partner with the recast dollars, which, uh, which is a $1 million allocation to the city of Minneapolis for five years. I think we're in our third year or so of that to ensure that we're having a collective impact. And so the city does put a lot of money on the table to address um, some of these issues. And I've been doing just some research to find out the breadth and depth of those resources because I'm not as uh, familiar with this topic as I am with some of the other issues that we've tackled on the council before. So, um, so I think this is really a good time for us to figure out what are the institutional changes that we're going to promote to ensure that we're having a coordinated, cohesive, organized, collective impact way to address um, violence in our communities and support them in healing through trauma from the trauma that they've experienced for generations. Um, and also um, figuring out a way where we're not reinventing the wheel each time we get a program or an initiative in, in city hall or in city government, because there's so many good lessons already that many of you as staff members who have been here much longer than council members have, um, can share with us to, to guide this work. And so figuring out how do we honor those lessons learned, how do we engage the energy of the council, and how do we help our city staff work together to have a more focused collective impact approach that we, where we can a year from now turn back and say, look how much those numbers have dropped. Uh, look how many uh, community members we've helped to support or helped and supported to address the issues of, of gun violence and, and violence in their communities. I think we all want uh, real tangible results 
And um, we certainly have a mayor's office who's more than willing to, to work with us on this front and to help us have these conversations. So I just wanna acknowledge that for me, this is a new kind of conversation and I think it's really good. And I, and I think that we can do a lot with this when we're looking at GVI, when we're looking at Next Step, at collaborative safety strategies, at recast, at build leaders, um, where we can really figure out how do we organize all of that work together to better have um, to have better services for our, for our residents and, and really figure out a way to more efficiently use those tax dollars. Thank you. Um, a couple of things I did want to mention going back to the health inspectors. Um, I wanted to mention that it, it appears that it's important to note the fee increase on health inspections only covers inflation. There's no additional, there isn't capacity to do more with that given the health inspection fees is that correct um madam chair uh, my understanding of the way that the city handles fees is that they go to the general fund and then you as policymakers decide how to spend them um, so when we increase fees it doesn't do anything to the health department's budget or anybody else's budget it goes to the general fund and then it's for um, policymakers to decide how to allocate it Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask um, our director, Intermill, of our budget just to maybe comment a little bit on that. Um, Madam Chair, uh, committee members, so earlier this year, council did vote to increase a number of business license fees, including health inspections for 2019. The uh, increase for the health inspections fees uh, for food, lodging, and pools was about 2%, and so that merely covers the inflationary cost for 2019. It doesn't sort of catch up on the um, the property tax subsidy. So there aren't necessarily extra dollars in the general fund to hire additional inspectors. It's just we're, we're not falling as far behind as we otherwise would have been. I see. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments um, about the health department budget overall um, and or I also want to point out they went through a results conversation and I know that the leadership of that committee was involved. Thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. Um, I have a few questions on that if there's time or I can take them offline. Councilmember Cunningham, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I actually wanted to follow up on the health inspectors. Um, do we have an idea around the sort of return on investment that there is per health inspector? Uh, I'll pass that over to Director Intermill. So, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So, if when we invest in in a health inspector in terms of like the the fees and the and, and the work that is done that is revenue generating, are we seeing, an, like what kind of ROI are we seeing on that investment, I suppose? So, uh, Madam Chair and Councilmember Cunningham, I think uh, in my memory, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, is that the revenues associated with the health inspections, the, the license fees, um, cover about 50% of the costs. Um, in terms of uh, return on investment, we often think, some, think about uh, other costs avoided, so I'm not sure um, you know, what sort of the public health ROI is, I think the health department would be much better suited to answer that question. But on the on the dollars and cents side, um, it's about 50% cost recovery from that license fee. Director, or Commissioner Musicant, if you, is there any um, particular, like if you would like to talk about the ROI of the public health aspect of having increased health inspections, that would be helpful. Um, Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, um, I think we can get you some information and we'll share that with the whole committee um, about uh, the, the changes that we've seen in decreasing the kinds of violations that we're encountering that seem to be most closely related to causing disease. And so we've been able, um, using the approach that, that um, includes education and not just um, inspect and um, assess fees, but really working with folks, we've been able to make our food environment a much safer food environment. 
um, and we have prepared some graphs about that in the past, and, and we'll, we'll share that. Um, the fewer staff we have, the more likely we are to just be inspecting and regulating and not doing the educational piece that seems to have net, netted the results that we think are moving us in the right direction. Great, thank you. That was um, the the point I, w I was hoping to to hear, which was um, the education piece. I know that if I'm not mistaken, I do believe that this health the health inspector or health inspections actually won an award for um, a best practice, if I'm not mistaken. And so, um, just really wanted to to point out that uh, that the health inspectors are doing work of interrupting the the violations and we know like who we we know that there's a cultural barrier oftentimes and so there's been a lot of work in the health inspections and the health department around the educational piece of health inspections which i just think is really powerful um while that makes us theoretically lose revenue um ultimately we're moving our businesses in a, a good direction. Our, our businesses um, are healthier, our, the consumers are healthier, our residents are healthier. So just really wanted to talk about both the dollar and cents and then also just the public health impact of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would also encourage people to look at the results on page eight, which talks about environmental health, and I think that it highlights some of the oh. um, differences in the inspections and the, the programs. And you you could you can see that the number um, percentage of of inspections that don't result in high risk factors being found is definitely increased. Of course, results end in 2017, so we um, we don't necessarily have what's been happening this year with the with the two. I also um, will commit to digging a little bit more into the increase in the fees. I think not only did we have an overall increase, but I think we looked at some of the entities like U.S. Bank Stadium and thought about, I, I believe um, the stadium was paying one um, fee to license all the food vendors, and we realized, well, this is ridiculous. We go in and we inspect all these different vendors, and they're paying the same price for uh, and this maybe this is just rhetorical, for like a food truck or for a really tiny uh, restaurant. Um, so I think we've tried to make some other corrections in there too, and maybe it, it'll still look like a 2% overall increase in the fees that we collect. Um, but that's just part of what goes into these. We, all of our inspectors, um, uh, I think, uh, maybe I'm wrong with some entity, but most of them are, um, don't, the fees don't cover all the expenses where you, property taxpayers out of the general fund are also contributing to all of these. So I think that's something to think about. But I just wanted to highlight that. But I really appreciate Councilmember Cunningham bringing up what are the other benefits that we get out of this. Um, and I think clearly that's that's one. And there may also be, be more. I know there's a lot of pressure we get from um, the state. We've had some other um, municipalities who are out of compliance with their obligations to um, the state and they, um, don't do the health inspections anymore. We do, and I think it really benefits our residents. And if we just look at all the cultural sensitivity and the the one on one that we're able to do with our restaurants and um, businesses, I think it um, folks will agree that it really pays off that we're doing those inspections. And so I want to make sure that we're doing them right. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Councilmember Gordon. Page eight is the, what I was talking about um, when I answered uh, Councilmember Cunningham's question. Uh, so I'm just curious because you have made huge progress with environmental health um, and you've been recognized nationally. I'm just curious and I know I see Patrick Hanlon here in the audience. What's what's worked so well here and is it something that we can look at other um, things we want to implement change in? Was it enforcement? Was it education? Is there something in particular that seems like it that you would want to really highlight that has worked so well with the environmental health results? Um, thank you, Councilmember Palmisano. I believe you're talking about our environmental services work, like green yes. business stuff. Yes. Okay. Um, so there, I think uh, the the key has been a win-win attitude, um, so that we are working with businesses to help them think about how to do their job in a different way that accomplishes our goal of lower pollution. Um, probably accomplishes goals for them of lower cost eventually if we 
help them buy some new equipment. Um, and then working with collaborators, um, retired engineers, folks at the university to really quantify the changes so that we can all see um, the outcome of, of what we are doing. I think we have brought some of that to um, work that CPED is doing around, is it 3D? Is that 4D? 4, I'm off by one number. Um, 4D. <laughs> Um, where there's an incentive for landlords um, to get a, um, a, I think, a, a tax break, but we have also brought to them, do you want further savings? Can we help you have an energy efficient uh, building? And so, um, again, uh, complementing the work that's already going on with, with this win-win approach, bringing together public and private dollars to do so and leveraging everyone's effort. Is, um, really netted an amazing growth in um, our results. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up on that. First, I would re really recommend my colleagues, if you not, have not had the opportunity to review the results, um, health results, I would strongly recommend, because you see some really, really great data there um, about the work that's constantly growing and the capacity that's constantly growing. If you look at page 10, talking about environmental services, which is different than environmental health, um, the environmental services on page 10, if you look at the pollution reduction, it's an astronaut, like it is an exponential growth in the amount of uh, pollution reduction that's happened. And so um, I was hoping to be able to hear more about why we've seen such a rapid increase um, of the reduction just more specifically about like what are the programs like how have folks been engaged just so that we can get a better understanding of this really great progress thank you uh, madam chair councilmember cunningham um we uh as you can see started out with an idea in 2012 and 13 and really just tried something out um but as we began to see how it worked working with businesses um we've been able to um, not only look at reducing um, volatile organic compounds, but now we're looking at carbon footprint, we're looking at energy efficiency, and so we're, we're adding layers of our work, and that's why it turns into kind of a complex um, graph by the end. So this work is part of why we are now a city that has no um, chemical called PERC in our dry cleaning businesses. And we are also working with, um, I think we're the first in the nation to be able to say that about ourselves. Um, this project, this way of working also has been recognized by the National Association of um, County and City Health Officers as a model practice. Um, it's something that, um, we're doing that's fairly unique. In addition to the green business work, we are also um, working um, with businesses to think about where can we plant more trees so we can build our, our canopy. Um, we are working with um, the indigenous community, Menwakan and Sioux and um, folks gardening, folks um, in South Minneapolis to look at a biochar, which is a chemical that holds carbon, so as we lose our ash trees, can we turn that into this carbon that will, this biochar that will sequester the carbon rather than release it into the air? And then there's some evidence that it actually pulls more carbon into the earth as well. So lots of um, planet-saving strategies, if you will, um, that we're doing here locally. Um, and it's important to work locally, but it's also setting an example um, across the country. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any further questions or comments. I will echo Councilmember Cunningham's um, uh, advertisement for the results uh, piece. I was taken by um, a number of the things in there for performance measures. I guess it was the environmental services piece that I was looking to attribute um, mm -hmm. to, to your colleague, Patrick, um, it, as well as interesting to see actually a decrease in compliance overall around our staple foods ordinance um, and I'll ask these questions more offline and then um, further work on our lead poisoning and healthy homes initiative so lots of stuff to see in there uh, but for now we've got to push on okay. um, to civil rights thank you for your mm -hmm. time thank you.
Uh, and we'll just transition to civil rights here. With us today, we have Director Corbel and um, Director, if you could maybe point out others in the audience that you have with you that you've brought to your presentation today. I meant to do that the last time. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Val McCorbel. I'm the director in the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. And I do have several members of the department's leadership team with me this morning. Um, Imani Jafar from the Office of Police Conduct Review, Brian Walsh from the Labor Standards Enforcement Division, Cassidy Gardner from the Civil Rights Equity Division, our newest uh, member in the Civil Rights Department, our new Complaint Investigations Division Director, Frank Reed. And Shanae Phillips is the Administrative Analyst for the Department who's also here this morning. So thank you for allowing me to do that, Madam Chair. So I'll just jump right into uh, the Civil Rights Department's um, Mayor Recommended Budget. This, uh, the org chart is in here, so I'll spend just a few minutes talking about, uh, talking about that. There are about 30 employees represented by this org chart and three appointed boards and commissions and the police conduct review panel. The staff in the Civil Rights Department can fluctuate uh, by season depending on the number of law clerks or step-up interns or urban scholars we have on board in a particular time. But the largest division inside the Civil Rights Department is the Contract Compliance Division. That division director is not here this morning. He's actually out with a, with a sick kid with this weather, no wonder. But that uh, division has uh, 10 employees in it, so that's the largest. The average is about four employees. Labor Standards Division is the smallest with an authorized complement of two. The change items from the mayor's recommended budget this year. Uh, the first one that you see on the screen is uh, a recommended increase of one FTE for the Labor Standards Enforcement Division. You, are, you all know that the Labor Standards Enforcement Division is a fairly new division. It's only about a year and a half old. The first two employees that uh, be, were became a part of that division were actually transfers from the city coordinator's budget in 2016. So this is actually the first staff increase in this uh, program since it came to the Civil Rights Department. The Labor Standards Division enforces the city's sick and save time ordinance as well as its minimum wage ordinance. So this $100,000 that is requested is an ongoing request to fund uh, one FTE in that division. The second um, change item is for collaborative enforcement. This is actually um, money for a partnership with a community-based organization, CTOOL, to help with organizing and outreach to workers in Minneapolis. We have had a very good relationship with CTOOL to date. CTOOL is also a member of the Workplace Advisory Committee. They have been very instrumental in organizing workers around these ordinances and any proposed new ordinances. They actually have also uh, forwarded complaints to the Civil Rights Department from workers who have experienced some violations of either the Sick and Save Time Ordinance or the Minimum Wage Ordinance. And this resource is to help us to um, extend that contract with say tool on, on an ongoing basis. This final change order from the mayor's recommended budget is to right size the, the salaries for our urban scholars. Every year we request money for urban scholars. Last, this last cohort I think was probably, I think it was 118 scholars not all in the city of Minneapolis, certainly, 
but we ask for resources to pay the urban scholar salaries plus money for programming every year. What we didn't take into consideration was the number of urban scholars that return to the city every year. And we do have a policy in this city of increasing the wages at a at very minimal level for returning urban scholars. About 90% of the city's urban scholars do return year by year, which we think is a good thing because if we get an urban scholar as a freshman in college and they come back every summer, by the time that urban scholar is done with their work here in the city, they actually can, uh, they have a year's worth of work experience. So they don't go into the workforce as a, as a new employee. And this is what uh, we set out to do with the Urban Scholars Program from the very beginning. And that's to give these young people that are about 90% people of color, some valuable work experience. So they're, they're not always the last hired, first fired in the event that um, something drastic would happen in a workplace where they are employed. Those are the change items, and I will answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. We do have a couple in queue. Um, we have Councilmember Bender. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is about labor standards enforcement. And so there is discussion among policymakers and our workplace advisory committee around um, policy change about wage theft and shifting more responsibility to the city for enforcement of wage theft. I think there's a lot of interest and support for that. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to either now or kind of in between here in the next few months about the resources that your department would need to be able to enforce any new policies around wage theft? Uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, Council President Bender, the resources that have been requested for the Labor Standards Division is actually to try to catch us up to where we are now. As you know, this is a this was a new ordinance. We didn't have a whole lot of history on what would happen with regards to complaints come into this division. We're learning some things about it and have learned some things about it over the year and a half. And so the complaints are increasing, but it's not just a matter of the complaints increasing. It's also a matter of the monies that we are able to recover for the individuals who have been the victim of either a sick and save time or a minimum wage violation. There's some ongoing research and work being done now by the Workplace Advisory Committee. Some of you may have uh, talked to members of the Workplace Advisory Committee as they talk about a wage theft policy that they'd like to bring forward uh, at the beginning of 2019 at the latest. So the resources to do this work is, is very people-centric. There's not a lot that you can get that technology can do when you're talking about outreach and complaint handling. And so if we can gauge sort of the increase of what's happened with sick and save time, I expect that when a wage theft ordinance would be put in place in the city, there would also be a need for resources to be able to enforce that portion of the ordinance. I would also um, just point out that the Civil Rights Department looks across the country at other cities that have enacted these municipal labor standards ordinances. And one of the things that we found is that we do this work really efficiently with the amount of staff that we have. And on a, on a pro, rata, pro rata basis, other cities are certainly um, putting more resources towards this work as they enact these new ordinances. So Labor Standards Division has been very efficient. We've leveraged the resources in the community to the fullest extent that we can. But the reality is, as the City Council adopts these new policies, there is a need for resources to be able to enforce what you give us to, uh, what you give us to enforce. Thank you. And I'll just note, it has been my assumption that if we did pass a wage theft policy that we would then be looking to put more resources in you know, either if not the 2019 budget, then the 2020 and, and ongoing budget to to allow you to be able to enforce that policy change. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to first take a quick moment to uh, remind my colleagues that the Civil Rights Department is also a an opportunity for us to be able to operationalize racial equity. Um, and to make sure that we're investing from that perspective um, around racial equity. So I say that for two reasons. First, um, there, 
for the calculation for actually being able to pay the returning urban scholars, which are disproportionately young people of color, um, the it would be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so the what was put into the budget was thirty thousand. So just to name that piece of it. Additionally, there was a request for um, a women and minority business enterprise procurement coordinator. Um, we've talked, uh, there's been a lot of conversations I feel like I've had with colleagues around talking about supplier diversity and how with the diverse, uh, excuse me, the disparity study, how that showed that the city is really falling behind around supplier diversity and have some, we have some pretty stark disparities. So when we're thinking about building community wealth in areas that need it the most, sit, uh, procurement with cities as an anchor institution is one way to be able to build community wealth. And so when we talk about business owners of color in particular, not being able to access the city and city contracts, this person would help facilitate that process. And so just thinking about growing the capacity of what does it look like to operationalize racial equity? And one, one component of it is racial, excuse me, um, community wealth building through utilizing the city as an anchor institution that uh, we are able to procure and build wealth uh, out in the community. So those are two components that I would just like for my colleagues to take into consideration as we talk about racial equity and, and what that means. We cannot forget that the Civil Rights Department is also a space for us to operationalize that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Corbell, so I was jogging my memory back to the um, conversation we had at the Public Safety Committee the last round, and we received um, a, a presentation from uh, the Office of Police Review where we reviewed some numbers in terms of how long it's taking for our staff to be able to do the intake process and I recall, I'm, I'm pulling up the, the number now and I'll forward it to my colleagues in a moment, that in 2016, it, it took about 10 days to complete the intakes that are, that are coming into the office, uh, into your department. And now in 2018, we see that it's taking 61 days. And so um, immediately when we had that conversation at the Public Safety Committee, I thought, oh, we, we gotta connect this to the budget. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts or recommendations about how we can address this to support the department to get through these um, these intakes, and my understanding is that the the demand for the type of services that the office um, that your department uh, offers the community has increased, and so I just want to make sure that the council is responding to that demand and that we're able to think about how we're funding that. And so I wasn't sure if there was money on the table now to figure out how we support that, or if there's kind of a plan or conversations that are happening that maybe I, I don't know about about how we can make sure we're supporting that work. Madam Chair, Council Member Cano, you know, I, I leave the resource discussions to, to the committee, but I will tell you there are some pretty significant uh, policy conditions that have created the increase in the staff's uh, workload. Uh, the first you may remember, uh, I don't know, Council Member uh, Gordon may be the only one who's on the council who may remember this, but back in 2012, when the police conduct ordinance was amended, there was um, a requirement put on staff at that time that complaints coming into the Office of Police Conduct Review would be handled by a civilian investigator on request. We have found that over the last five and a half years that all of the intake and most of the investigations in the Office of Police Conduct Review are done by the civilian investigators. That's added to the workload. We also know that with the new uh, body camera policy and the focus on the amount of time that body cameras are on, the, um, the investigations that are undertaken by the Office of Police Conduct Review by my staff has to take into consideration the monitoring and the review of all of that body camera tape as they're putting uh, their cases together and making a determination on the disposition of those cases. So there are some pretty, and in addition, the complaint workload itself, the number of complaints have increased. The, um, the staff um, 
back in 2012, 2013, were somewhat admonished because we were not doing enough engagement and outreach with the community to let them know that there was a civilian oversight mechanism in the city where, where individuals could file complaints. So the staff has undertaken a significant amount of work over the last several years to be out in the community talking to people mm -hmm. about the existence of the Office of Police Conduct Review. They've, um, the staff created these yellow contact cards that police officers actually carry. They're at the precinct. They're uh, unveiling a pilot now for uh, stations inside uh, community buildings and police precincts where individuals can file complaints. So all of this work adds up to an increase in the workload. And so the, the, the thing that I would leave you with is that it, it, it takes bodies to get the work done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that context. I appreciate it. So I've forwarded that information to our colleagues and I'm hopeful that we can try to figure out how to address it through the budget process because it's kind of a, a, a thing that just came before us at the Public Safety Committee. So we should really dig in and, and see what we can do in December. December 7th. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, so there have been some uh, high-profile stories recently about um, uh, labor violations on construction sites in the Twin Cities. And obviously, building trades is one of those uh, industries that has been a source of really good jobs in our community. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to make sure that we don't allow that to become a trend. Um, and so I guess I want to make sure that the investment that we're making in enforcement, both through the collaborative enforcement uh, project and the additional inspector uh, is going to actually sort of address those needs, right? Because uh, we've been we've had some huge wins, I think, in the civil rights department around um, uh, report-based um, enforcement, right? When we hear from somebody, uh, we've been able to follow up and uh, uh, prevail uh, in getting workers the wages that they're owed. Uh, which is great. Uh, it also occurs to me that as we, when we go to a job site, uh, we do we do send people to a job site to see if the plumbing was installed correctly. Um, the state sends somebody to see if the electrical was installed correctly. And I've heard that in some cities, we send somebody to ask workers directly, when's the last time you were paid? Um, are, mm -hmm. are, are you feeling safe on the job site? Are we going to have the resources through one or the other of these investments um, to do some of that proactive reaching out to workers? Uh, and spot checking to make sure that the industry is behaving in a way that uh, reflects our values. Madam Chair, Councilmember Fletcher, the, the labor standards work, the, the resources that have been requested for labor standards work are really centered around, around sick and safe time, minimum wage enforcement, and preparation for a potential new wage theft ordinance. It's our contract compliance division that actually looks at whether or not fair wages are being, not just fair wages, but wages in general are being paid properly on our construction, on the city's construction projects. It has been um, a little bit of time since the resources in the contract compliance division have increased significantly, but that's another area where the work has increased. And I, this, the, but no, this is just not my favorite time of year. The budget development is just not because I, I feel like I come here begging at least once a year. But the reality is that every time the city sells a construction license to a company that's going to build a public project, that creates work for us. So we go out and we celebrate that aspect of the work, but there's a corresponding, uh, there's a component of that work when there's a public project there that requires uh, work be done by the contract compliance department, uh, the contract compliance division. And so as the work increases, and I'm, I know you're hearing this story from every department. I know I'm not the only one, but, um, but that's the reality that as the work increases, as you sell um, more licenses for construction projects, as there are more workers on these construction projects, the likelihood that some of them are probably not going to be paid what they're supposed to be paid is a reality. Now, the Contract Compliance Division has also been very successful in um, getting back wages that are being lost by whatever nefarious practices uh, construction companies may be doing on the job. 
but there's certainly a lot we could be a bit more proactive in that and we just don't have the ability to send staff out on on the job site to do that one of the things that we talked about at our results conference this last time is how to leverage other departments to help us do that but that uh, that that also creates a need for an injection of resources because there's some training and some familiarity and some time that is required to, required to be able to do that but that's one thing that we did point out in our last results conference and we'll continue to look at that to see how we can be more proactive thank you council president bender ah, thank you madam chair you know i just wanted to make a comment quickly here that ties together some of the threads i think we heard and i don't know this for sure but it seems to me we should reflect on whether or not the additional work that we're asking staff to do without additional resources disproportionately falling on women and people of color employees in the city and just truly reflect on on that dynamic um, we know that only 29 percent of our workforce is women and it's even lower i think for people of color and and i just keep saying my concern here that we keep asking um, employees that we are trying to recruit and retain to do more and more and more uh, often without more resources Thank you. Uh, are there other questions and comments from committee members? <coughs> uh, I don't want to go too far beyond the time here with this one, but uh, Director Corbell, in looking through the results presentation, and I know that there was some healthy discussion at the results meeting, I was curious um, about some of these things, and I guess the one that I'll I'll touch on and I recognize this is 2017 data, but the Complaint Investigations Division, um, it seems that um, it, it was a performance measure. Um, the case basis filed with Complaint Investigation Division by year, it seemed that there were a lot less um, cases filed in 2017 than previous years, actually almost 70 less than the year before. And I was curious what your thoughts were um, uh, about the about the drop in cases filed, uh, Madam Chair and Committee members, that's uh, you're right. There was healthy dis discussion at the results conference about that, and one of the anomalies here. Well, there there are several things, but I'll I'll talk about the first in in that the the city of Minneapolis has a work share agreement with the federal government, the, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission where we have um, the opportunity to recover about $750 per case for investigating cases that are jurisdictional at both the federal government level but also at the city level. One of the things that happens with that contract is that staff over the years has become so fixated on meeting the federal contract. There are other areas of the civil rights ordinance that we are not paying enough attention to and that come that happens for two for two reasons one is that we have um, again complaint investigations is a, is a very labor intensive resource intensive type of um, type of area when we spend a lot of time trying to uh, work on complaints that are covered under that federal contract we lose track are unable to spend time looking at cases that are not employment cases, and that's what's happened over the last uh, the last couple of years. One of the things that we talked about at the results conference was restructuring that federal contract so that we're not so focused on on that, but to look at ways to do better outreach, engage engage community around um, the areas and bases in the civil rights ordinance, and uh, increasing the the complaints that come in to the city of Minneapolis. So I think we have a I think we have a fix for that. The reality is we're just at our desk, heads down, doing complaint investigations on a reactive basis where we just don't have the resources to be out in community letting people know that we're here. And so we're going to try to spend time in um, 2019 and beyond actually being more in the community and talking with folks. Thank you. Um Seeing no other colleagues in queue or on the dais, uh, 
I think that wraps up our civil rights budget presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we'll Mayor. just spend a moment transitioning to the city attorney's office. Thank you. I, I'm, nope. That's the, anyway, we'll get there in a minute. But I'm happy to be here, and I will say, Madam Chair and members of the Budget Committee, that this is the first year I actually followed the rules on our PowerPoint <laughs> and um, did not add any slides uh, to the PowerPoint or... Um, including any, um, I usually try to add at least one funny slide, but I followed the rules this year. Um, <laughs> at any rate, and I am just back from, from I was invited to be a panelist at a uh, criminal justice reform conference for judges across the country. And my panel was the Brooklyn District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez on the left, and Tina Luongo, who was the, um, uh, they have different titles for them, but she's the head of public defense for the whole city of New York. And so I'm coming back with all kinds of new ideas and things, but it was quite an honor to be with them. Super. Plus one for not adding any slides. You might be the only one that had. Okay. <laughs> oh, darn. I didn't, I was trying to follow the rules this year. So who are we and what, what do we do? Um, we, we wear two hats, we're uh, prosecutors, we prosecute all adult crime in the city of Minneapolis punishable by up to a year in jail. All things dealing with uh, people under the age of 18 and then felony crime over the age of 18 is our county attorney's office jurisdiction. And then on the civil division, we are your law firm. So we do all this, the uh, legal defense, um, we bring proactive litigation on occasion to recover funds owed the city uh, and to defend other rights um, as well as providing uh, advice to all of you and the city's departments and the boards and commissions. So our our uh, change items um, this year are uh, just a few, and it's really a continuation of programs that we've started um, before for the most part. Um, this Pathways program, um, it's for individuals carrying a gun uh, without a permit, which is the most serious gun-related uh, offense that our office prosecutes. Um, we got interested in this, I got interested actually as one of our um, prosecutors who handled these cases because they're largely all young adults, ages 18 through 26. Um, and uh, she noted that often this was their first adult offense. So then it raised the question in my mind of, do we just need better education? Because fortunately or not, um, it is lawful to uh, carry a gun in the state of Minnesota. You just need a permit. Um, or um, was there something else um, with this uh, group um, and and so we looked at, we went backwards in our case history um, and found out that even though we were counting convictions and we were counting uh, how many cases that the county attorney's office enhanced to a felony because it is an enhanceable offense and patting ourselves on the back, um, we weren't helping uh, these young men at all. As a matter of fact, um, there was a 70% recidivism rate and often to more serious felonies and often to violent felonies. Um, so we might have been doing them more good by actually not prosecuting them at all. And so um, we looked for, uh, we did a request for a proposal and got a 
a really good, strong proposal from Urban Ventures to do some community-based programming and trauma-informed programming. And it's just been uh, really successful. We had to negotiate a bit with our public defender's office because they thought our initial offer wasn't good enough and that actually all we were doing was trying to set up their clients for failure and that they'd wind up with a conviction after all. Um, and so with Mary Ellen Hang, my criminal deputy was here. We agreed to a stay of adjudication. Um, and uh, we've had almost 40 uh, young men go through this program. Um, and they've successfully all graduated out of phase one, which is 82 hours of really intensive programming over three months, and are in phase two. Um, which is every two weeks they touch base with a mentor um, or engage, uh, cooperate with or, or participate in a group at Urban Ventures. A number of them have signed on for additional voluntary programming. Um, they, you know, some parenting programming offered through Urban Ventures so they can reconnect with their kids. So it's just the kind of work if we can um, address underlying needs. Uh, rather than just punishing and, and trying to serve the criminal justice system where we can make a real uh, difference. And so that's, this con allows us to continue um, this program forward. Um, if I could pause you there. Um, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, City Attorney. I wanted to ask some more questions um, about this particular program. Um, first, the you. I feel like in a recent presentation you had mentioned that there was the concern about the not like a strong enough flow of um, participants into the program. So um, from just kind of thinking moving forward with this program, has there what kind of considerations of other offenses could qualify for a program? Like, have you identified other areas of intervention? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Cunningham, uh, that's a great question. We have reached out to uh, uh, the juvenile division um, so that their 16 and 17 year olds could be referred to this program. Because when we first started looking at this, people said, oh, the, you know, there's a juvenile gun program, just copy what they're doing. But I met with the uh, uh, representative from the Community Corrections Department who actually designed that and said, this really isn't as robust as it should be. It's not a model I would follow. Um, and so there has been interest in that. We've reached out to the suburban prosecutors um, to see if there's interest in the suburbs of referring people. Um, we've expanded somewhat the, the kinds of cases instead of just carrying a pistol without a permit. It's now all of our gun-related offenses. And Mariona, are there other things we're looking at as well? Um, we've talked about We have talked about, is there a way to modify this program for possibly first time domestic abusers because of the programming they're offering? Um, it would have to be changed because part of, the, part of the problem we have is with misdemeanor offenses, they're only on probation for a year. So we have to make sure whatever program we, we impose, they can actually complete it knowing there's gonna be a few bumps in the road and oftentimes 12 months just doesn't give us a lot to work with if we wanted to actually have any teeth and any substance to it. Um, but I haven't yet, but I was going to reach out to Priscilla just to see what her thoughts are, because I think from what we're seeing from our initial results, uh, the young men that are committing these first time domestic abuse, they might benefit for something. So I think we're going to explore that and see if that's another area. Um, and so we're kind of trying to think about other ways, uh, because that is a problem, because it's very driven by the number of cases and our cases ebb and flow. Some weeks we get three or four, we charge them and they're all, I just charged one yesterday and he's eligible, hopefully he'll take it. But then if we don't get the cases, they kind of push them through and they then they dry up and then they don't have enough people to participate. So, yeah. um, so yes, we're gonna continue to explore other offenses that this type of programming might really make an impact. Great, thank you. I also just wanna make the quick point um, and, and say this with grace, but we've heard a lot about young men, but the first person who participated, I believe, in this program was a young woman. Yes, and, and she's our only successful graduate so far all the way through 
Um, we just referred another woman yesterday. It's been interesting. We don't charge many women with this offense. We've charged, I think, seven or eight. And those are the only two that have taken it. We've offered it to them all. Um, but for some reason, they chose not to participate and just take the sentencing. Um, and so I think that's an area we can continue to explore because we do occasionally charge uh, young women. Um, typically, we find the gun is usually their partners and they're covering for them because they're facing more serious penalties. Um, and so we have to kind of work through that dynamic. But but you are correct. I think we definitely do offer it to the female defendants. They just don't seem as interested in taking it. Yeah. And and also, you know, when it comes to domestic violence, the um, OPCR found that um, domestic violence calls were not being labeled necessarily as such because um, of same sex couples. And the when we think about who typically is erased and, and can miss opportunities it's actually masculine presenting women identified people of color um and uh that's something that i have noticed um in terms of when i've worked with homeless youth the disproportionality of black masculine presenting women um at youth link and other um homeless services spaces um and then just thinking about like when how does toxic masculinity show up also for women um, and how women also perpetuate that can a little bit be erased. So um, I just wanted to to name that component of it, too, because, you know, same sex uh, domestic violence can go unseen because people just assume that women don't engage in abuse like that. I think there's just maybe some uh, biases there um, and assumptions, but I just wanted to make sure that we name that into the space because oftentimes that can get erased. Now, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Cunningham, thank you so much for making that point. And that is something that um, we stressed with the, uh, when um, I was leading the effort to do the um, human trafficking grant that brought us Sanu Shrestha, um, is making sure that we're doing uh, more outreach and finding the cases involving LGBTQ. Um, the community, and I think in domestic violence, we need to do a lot more in that field also, because we've just been not seeing those cases, and they are there. So thank you very much um, for that. Uh, so our victim witness um, program, we applied for a grant um, specifically to do a greater out outreach for non-English speaking um, victims. The grant runs out. Towards the end of this year, we wanted to continue this position, and so this just gives us the FTE so we can continue the position um, through the year uh, and um, figure out how to keep this going forward, um, whether it's actually permanently adding an FTE or whether, um, you know, as, as we've had vacancies, uh, we have often uh, uh, moved positions around to really fit uh, the needs we have now in our office, and we've repurposed uh, existing FTEs. And so this gives us time to figure that out um, without uh, having to end this, this valuable uh, position and figure things out before uh, the 2020 budget. And our victim witness service people really uh, work with victims and witnesses, make sure they get to court, make sure they're getting the support um, that they need, which is really important, particularly in the domestic violence um, area. Our domestic uh, violence. If I could just pause you there, Councilmember Cunningham. I'm sorry to interrupt again. <laughs> um, I wanted to see, um, just ask, is. So I see that Spanish is the specific language. Is that data driven based on the amount of language uh, interpreter requests from MPD? Yeah, I'm, this, um, I'll, I'll let Mary Ellen answer, but um, it, this was a person who had great skills and Spanish speaking abilities. So it could have been, uh, a Somali speaker. I mean, it was really to help with mm -hmm. outreach. It wasn't specifically for Spanish, but Marianne, go ahead. Okay. But um, the, the two main languages we see for our victims are Somali and Spanish. And so when we were 
filling the position, we had really hoped to find someone. We, did, we didn't think we'd find someone that spoke both. That That'd would be, be like, you know, <laughs> the star. Unicorn. <laughs> um, but we did purposely try to find a qualified candidate that spoke one or the other. And then we found Carolina, and she was very fluent in Spanish. And uh, that was certainly, it, it's very helpful to us. And I do think we tend to have more Spanish-speaking victims um, on a lot of the lower-level offenses, a lot of our traffic. So it's very helpful. She just takes all of those cases. She can converse with them. Uh, in their own language, we get much better input. They get much better understanding. Um, uh, but it would be, you know, awesome if we could add a person that was fluent in Somali. That would be a great need. Those are our two big languages. Um, but I think we're better off having the Spanish speaker because we have more of those victims than in that we use our interpreter services very well to help with the others. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's what I was curious about. Is is what drove that and also just out of concern because I know that there probably is a large language barrier with the Somali community as well. So I just wanted to check in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this is, um, we're still calling it a pilot even though Mike got intermill said all pilots at some point must come to an end. Um, <laughs> but uh, we started this four years ago I think and it was the, you know, in, uh, the Civil Rights Department did a follow-up uh, report on this issue that we had noticed um, previously, um, the number one call for service to 911 in violent crime hotspots area is are coded uh, as being for domestic violence. Yet um, most of those do not result in police reports. So we started this trying to figure out are there criminal cases being missed, um, what's happening here, what are the needs of these families. And it's uh, so paired a specially trained, you know, police officers from those precincts to go out in a non-enforcement capacity with a family therapist from a social service um, provider that specializes in domestic, in the field of domestic violence to just do follow-ups because these families are in stress, they're living in high crime areas and there are needs there. And through this proactive um, approach, um, most uh, people actually answer the door and engage in a conversation and then we found that they do follow up calls to the family therapist because they have a face and a phone number. And so we, we uh, have programs now both in North and South Minneapolis. The police inspectors want us to continue this um, forward. They find it helpful. Um, we have a special program in Little Earth now um, and the family therapist there has really good relationships uh, within that community. We're doing, we're continuing this year to do listening sessions um, through the Cultural Wellness Center and we may reach out to other um, uh, providers and other, you know, uh, with ties to some of our other uh, culturally specific communities um, to start thinking about what alternatives there might be uh, to law enforcement with um, cases where you don't really need a law enforcement response. What kind of community-based um, alternative are people looking for um, and would meet their needs um, and help if there's a crisis, if you're having trouble controlling your, your uh, kid, for example, um, that members of the community may prefer, um, that may be a better suited uh, response and um, uh, might might help to serve that that gap between calling police for help, which people should absolutely, um, but but it's nice also to be able to offer community-based um, alternatives. So we're continuing to to do that kind of work with um, uh, listening sessions being set up by Cultural Wellness Center and others this next year. On that note, um, I just want to recognize Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to note, I think that this work is is extremely important piece of our violence prevention. And I know we've had many conversations with the city attorney's office, health department, and the police chief about the fact that so many of our perpetrators of violence in community have in their records, going all the way back to their childhoods, their first interaction with police was being a victim or witness of violence in the home as a child and this very high correlation between experiencing domestic violence in the home as a child and becoming violent in our community. 
among all of the other reasons to want to prevent domestic violence. Um, that is one. And so I think this funding is really important. In the past several years, uh, some of us council members have also been able to add funding for um, support services for families who are experiencing violence in the home. And in particular, two, um, well, there are three areas we have funded. One is for families who are non-English speaking to receive counseling and support. Another is a very unique program for male perpetrators of violence that has very good success rates in, um, in low rates of recidivism, right? Is that the right way to say that word? Um, uh, so a successful way to help male perpetrators of violence find new tools and ways to cope. And then the second innovative program that I think is really unique in the country is for very young children who are experiencing violence in their home, again, either as witness or victim, from ages from birth to, I think, age three. Um, and so I wanted to note that just as a piece that we've been able to find funding for in the past. It's, it's never been proposed in the mayor's budget since I've been on the council, but um, wanted to note that as a piece of this work. And I know that has gone through the health department, technically in the budget, but it's really been a collaboration between these three departments that are leading this work. Well, Council President, no, thank you, because that is really important as we, um, as science is helping us understand more just the profound impact of exposure to violence um, and trauma and the lasting impact of that. And the sooner we can address that and provide people with the services they need that are actually helpful to them, um, the better off we are. And one thing that um, I am I am committed to doing over this next year is really looking closely at the programming for the cases that we prosecute in domestic violence and make sure it's high quality, top quality, that we're not just shaming and getting convictions, but that we're really uh, helping people get the tools that they need um, to avoid the violence. Because often um, the, the victims, they don't want to end the relationship, they just want the violence to stop. So thank you for that. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Yeah, I just wanted to um, really emphasize uh, what Co Council President Bender mentioned around um, early adverse childhood experiences. Um, that is one of the biggest motivators for me around domestic violence work uh, because of the fact that I've worked with young people who are so traumatized um, by their experience, um, either witnessing or um, firsthand experiencing violence. And when we talk about domestic violence, that actually includes like everybody in the house. So that's also like, parent-child abuse is also falls within domestic violence. And uh, if you look at the foster care system, I'm really deep in it right now. Um, if you look at the foster care system, like all of the kids, every single one of them have had to be abused and neglected in order to be put there really in the first place. And so this is, and then we see kids get lost in the system, um, the foster care system and not be able to, to find stable housing and, and homes. And so this is another opportunity for us to be able to interrupt that cycle of children being removed from the homes and instead parents being equipped with better skills and uh, whether it's coping skills, uh, parenting skills, et cetera, to be able to raise their children um, in healthier ways. And so as we're looking at this outreach really um, Thinking about protecting our babies, I just feel like a very strong, like this has lifelong impacts, the way that it, it connects the brain. Um, so we as a council, if we are looking long term, if we're investing super upstream, this is really an area that we have to be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you. And that it is just the kind of understanding um, and beliefs that you show and the support that you have uh, for reform work um, that helps me love my job. I mean, one of the discussion topics yesterday among the judges was um, how about uh, when you're in a jurisdiction that does not value reform and how do you, how do, you do that? How do you deal with the blowback? And that is certainly uh, not a problem here in the city of Minneapolis, I'm very proud to say. Um, Juvenile sex trafficking, uh, victim shelter services, 
Um, this continues the funding. This will be the third year, um, I believe, uh, to help with a little bit of the funding needed um, to provide shelter services. And there's just some, the link operates very high quality program. There are kids from Minneapolis that are there. And um, this just is, is a little bit of our city's commitment um, to uh, helping these kids. So thank you for this, my anticipated support of this item <laughs> from all of you. Is that the last slide? Yes, I believe that was the last slide. We're not, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can't ask questions because that slide is not here. I was so efficient. <laughs> well, we but, do have a question from Council President okay. Benner, so I'll let her go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really briefly, I want to thank you so much for your leadership in our city. We are nationally recognized for the work that you are doing on reform, and we shouldn't take for granted that we have a city attorney that is looking at ways we can support perpetrators and people who are being arrested in our city and looking and taking such a careful look at how we can support people in every aspect of their lives. And it's it's noticed and so very appreciated. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the queue. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to note that after this, we do have the youth coordinating board that's supposed to come in for the last 15 minutes and, oh, and they're right there. Hello. <laughs> um, I think we can be ready to transition. Um, this is going to be a short one and that's good because there's a fire drill anticipated in about a half oh. hour. So. How do I get my... Give me a hand. Well, I'm getting help, which I always, by the way, need technical help on my slides. Um, I'll begin, if you don't mind. Madam Chairperson, members of the committee, thank you for inviting us here today to talk about the Youth Coordinating Board and our budget for 2019. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd do a little background on the YCB before I talk about our budget request, because many of you are new and you may not know who we are or why we're here or why we exist or anything else about us. So. Let me say, first of all, that, um, oh. um, first of all, that the Youth Coordinating Board has been a Minneapolis institution since 1983, when Minneapolis Public School Superintendent Richard Green, for whom Green School is named, wrote to Mayor Don Frazier requesting that the mayor explore the possibility of establishing an ongoing collaboration committee council composed of policy-making level officials to look toward the best possible network of services for Minneapolis youth. Mayor Frazier took that request seriously, and at his direction, his staff created the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board. The board is the first of its kind in the United States. It's the longest lasting joint powers board in the United States focused on children and youth, and it is a, an organization that has a rich legacy of accomplishment. Our goal, of course, is always to make Minneapolis the best place for children and youth in the United States. We do come up number one and two on a number of different kind of surveys, but we are continuing to make that happen. Here's a short list of some of our accomplishments. Things that have come forward from our table include things like Step Up, the Minneapolis Youth Congress, Way to Go, our outreach teams, etc. According to the most recent data, there are about 91,319 children living in Minneapolis. This is, this is 2010 census data. That's about 24% of the population of Minneapolis under age 20. Let me tell you a little bit about our children. Approximately 62% of our children and young people under the age of 20 are of color. That stands in stark contrast to the adult population in which approximately 60% of our residents are white and 30% are of color. Three in 10 of our children and young people live in households with an income below the poverty line. 
The Minneapolis Public Schools reports that 64% of their students receive free or reduced priced meals. They also report that 10% of their students are homeless or highly mobile, and 24% are English language learners. What we believe about our children is this. Individually, collectively, and supported by adults, our children and young people possess the skills and abilities to prepare themselves to lead and operate in this community now and into the future. And we are committed to making sure that they can do that. This is a list of our various goals and some of the activities under them, just some background for you. From the very beginning of our work, the YCB has been about develop developing and testing strategies to close the racial and socioeconomic gap. We know that stability in housing, food, safety, and in positive adult support have a significant impact on the success of our children and in the last presentation, you heard about one area of that that's extremely important. After school activities, early childhood program services, employment training and internships, and an economic system that works for everyone are some of the critical support systems that assist our children. And we see the greatest disparities in outcomes for children and youth of color and those living in poverty. It is important then at the YCB that we really understand and learn about how racism plays a significant role in those disparities. And if we don't address racism through the work that we do, we will con continue to see those disparities grow. We'll have more homelessness, lower graduation rates, under or unemployment, long-term poverty, and violence. We exist to ensure that outcomes and opportunities for children and young people are no longer, uh, th that opportunities and outcomes based on race for children and young people are no longer predictable. We intend to work ourselves out of a job at the YCB, as a matter of fact, it's one of our goals. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the, fu the uh, funds that the city of Minneapolis allocates to the YCB through the Minneapolis Health Department. First of all, we're grateful to you for your support of our downtown outreach team. This youth engagement team's been working for six years on the streets. Previous to this, they were the Youth Are Here bus circulator group. They work in the summertime to give our young people a caring and trusting adult to help them navigate while downtown. You may have seen us also on the north side or at Henry High School. We also operate in those uh, places, but with different funding. In 2007, the Youth Coordinating Board decided that they needed to invest in a formalized, professionally staffed organization which would be able to bring youth to the table in the public sector. The Minneapolis Youth Congress was born and continues to be active in Minneapolis. You may have witnessed their testimony about Tobacco 21 and Rethink Your Drink. They've also been instrumental in a number of things, including bringing youth, youth perspective to the issue of sex trafficking, and they have been involved in making sure that public transportation works for all people, having tested the bus pass program the Minneapolis Public Schools uses now for two years. And that program is based on their work. Since our since, since inception, over 500 young people have participated in the Youth Congress. We are grateful to the city for that work to happen. I also wanna let you know that we're the largest youth public, public service organization in the country and we uh, make sure that our children are trained and well cared for. After school activities have been proven to increase math scores in poor and working class children, they have been shown to give children the 21st century skills such as conflict resol resolution, team building and communication skills which are required in today's workplace. They also help working parents and keep our youngest citizens safe, yet, we are seeing drastic cuts in funding for after-school programming in Minneapolis and across the state. Funding has plummeted in Minneapolis from approximately $37 million to, in 2010 to less than $5 million in 2017, and we expect that to be cut in half over the next year. We are grateful that with funding of the city of Minneapolis, we are able to support three after-school programs, the Teen Tech Center, supported by Hennepin County Libraries, the Minneapolis Community and uh, programs at Minneapolis Community Education 
and also the youth line at the Minneapolis parks so that they can show, serve children all of those programs who might not otherwise be served. Our friend John Outlaw is here from the parks. I saw John come in from youth line. Furthermore, family, friend, and neighbor providers care for approximately 70% of our children every day. We're aware of that many of these children are from families who have endured long-term poverty. They're immigrants, they're refugees, and their parents often work evenings and weekends, times when child care centers are not open. While we know that these children are safe and well tended in those family, friend, and neighbor programs, we also know that for a variety of reasons, they may not have access to the same resources as children who are cared for in early childhood centers. This frequently leaves them behind when they start in school. I'm happy to let you know that the Pritzker Foundation has awarded the YCB a two-year fellowship to build a framework specifically for those providers who work with 70% of our children. The National League of Cities has also put forward some money for us. In fact, today I'm meeting with the National League of Cities for lunch to talk about our program and our update, but we're thought of as a national model in working on family, friend, and neighbor care. So in order to move the needle forward for our children in today's climate, we're going to need some new tactics. A promising tactic which is being tested throughout the United States right now is that of children's savings accounts. In order to close the wealth equity gap, and it is proving to be a pretty good strategy in numerous places. Over the past two years, the city has invested $55,000 in the development of this strategy. The YCB has made good use of this fund, these funds, and we stand ready to move forward to the next steps. As the YCB board has become more and more educated about the value of children's savings accounts, they have become more and more supportive of us moving forward as well. A request for funds for 2019 has not been included in the mayor's budget. And finally, before I end with our, our last quote of our, from our other founder, I want to say that um, we are working this year on updating the Children and Youth Master Plan. The last one was done in 1987. Things have changed a little bit since then. We are happy to welcome Michaela Ferg, who is here with us today as our AmeriCorps VISTA staff member to coordinate the plan. In March and April, you will be asked to participate with us as we coordinate 13 ward meetings facilitated by the Minneapolis Youth Congress to gather information from young people about their hopes and dreams for Minneapolis. A final report will be available next fall. I have some time for me to make my budget presentation. So I'd like to end with a quote from our founder, our other founder, founder Mayor Don Frazier. He said in his State of the City address in, uh, 20, in 1986, we've got to start a revolution right here in downtown and in the neighborhoods of Minneapolis. We're watching too many youngsters in our community growing up with inadequate nurturing, no positive role models, lack of basic skills, low self-esteem, and even lower expectations for what they can do in the world. We're going to foment the revolution in a reasoned way, being able to demonstrate a measurable change through the 20 years which it takes a generation to grow up. I hope we can keep doing the revolution, and I hope we can step it up a bit. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions or comments. Thank you for everything that you do. I had the opportunity to be part of the Youth Coordinating Board last term, and um, Councilmember Cunningham has taken Sorry. my role, um, and I'm going to pass it over to him for some final comments. Yes, just real quick, because I know everybody's ready to go, but um, I just wanted to, um, I had the good fortune of working with the YCB um, quite a lot in my previous position here at the city. And um, I really wanted to take a quick moment to talk about after school funding in particular. Um, this is a huge issue that we're going to be facing, um, and this is going to be an increasing issue. In the federal 2019 budget, I do believe it is that the 21st century community learning centers are actually cut entirely. Um, and so that has been the main source of funding. And so th that's a, a really big issue that we're, we're going to be facing. And um, additionally, um, just briefly, could you talk about some of the positive outcomes from what, what we've seen with children's savings accounts in other cities? 
Yeah, um, it, there's a couple of things that I would say about that. Uh, and I could talk about this for a very long time, so I won't. But one of the things that we know is that children who have a nest egg of $500, uh, lim uh, the lower limit of $500 when they graduate from high school are more li three times more likely to go to college than other children. Um, another outcome that we've seen more and more throughout the country is that these children's savings accounts are a way for the community to invest in children in pretty simple ways sometimes. There's a place where their local grocer has a card that you can put money into that card for your child or other children if you don't need to do that. I think for me as a mom, I would say one of the biggest outcomes is the data that we're beginning to see on the parent's sense of hopefulness and expectation for their child. The earlier we give a children's savings account to a child, the quicker the parent feels hopeful and excited about their child's future. And the data shows that within a year, those parents who receive that savings account, their children who do, their hopefulness goes up. And in comparable surveys, the parents' hopelessness goes up, hopefulness goes down. So it is created as a way to help build wealth in communities where there's not wealth. It's a way to help people feel uh, that they have uh, the ability to achieve things that in their lives they might not feel they have the ability to achieve. And I think it's, it's uh, I've, I've just been reading a book that's just come out about children's savings accounts and it's an amazing tiny strategy, tiny, that we can do for our smallest citizens to help them be prepared and ready to move forward into the future. And when I first heard about it, I have to tell you honestly, I thought, how's that going to make any difference? But I've seen the data, I've seen the families, seen the programs. It's absolutely incredible. And it's something as a city I hope we can find a way to continue doing soon rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. I Thank you. want to stay on time in our adjournment of the Budget Committee. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, before we do, everybody hold on. I did not see um, the flag of Council Member Jenkins. Go ahead. Yeah, my speaker management is not working for some reason. But thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to comment um, that St. Paul is actually enacting this program. And, you know, in the words of keeping up with the Joneses, I think we have to give the young people of the city of Minneapolis the same opportunity too. So I will be looking for ways to support um, children's savings accounts as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member. And there we go. Um, Thank you. We're adjourned.